Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our very first virtual book event of 2021. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. My name is Kate Bruns, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, the Harvard University Division of Science, the Harvard Library, and our co-sponsor tonight, the Leakey Foundation, I am so pleased to introduce this event with Daniel Lieberman, discussing his latest book, Exercised why something we never evolved to do is healthy and rewarding. Tonight's lecture is the latest installment in our Harvard Science Book Talk series, which works to bring the authors of recently published science-related literature to our Cambridge community and now beyond. To learn more about upcoming science book talks when they're announced, you can sign up for the bookstore's email newsletter at harvard.com or visit the webpage harvard.com science. We also have a Science Research Public Lecture Series YouTube page where you can watch any previous talks that you might have missed. This evening's event is going to conclude with some time for your questions. If you would like to ask Dr. Lieberman something, please go to the Q&A chat at the bottom of your screen where you can submit your question. We're going to get through as many as time allows for this evening. Also, once the event begins, I'm going to be posting a link in the chat to purchase tonight's featured book, Exercised. All sales through this link support Harvard Bookstore. So thank you for your patronage, your purchases and your contributions. And I'll also be dropping a donate link in the chat, make this virtual author series possible. And now more than ever, ensure the future of a landmark independent bookstore. Uh, thank you to our partners at Harvard University. And thank you to all of you for tuning in and showing up for our authors, indie book selling, and especially for science. And finally, as you might have experienced in virtual gatherings, um, technical issues can arise. And if they do, I'm going to do my best to resolve them quickly. Um, but before I introduce tonight's speaker, I would also like to play a brief video welcome from president of the Leakey Foundation, Camilla Smith. So please bear with me while I pull that up. My name is Camilla Smith, and I'm president of the Leakey Foundation. For over 50 years, the Leakey Foundation has been dedicated to supporting human origins research and sharing discoveries with the general public in programs like this. We explore the big questions of what it means to be human. And we do this by funding research of scientists like our speaker, Dr. Daniel Lieberman. We share this research through events like this and online in our lunch break science series and also in our origin stories podcasts. Dr. Lieberman has done remarkable research in how homo sapiens bodies work as compared to other mammals and to the other great apes. Uh, he is not only a Leakey Foundation grantee, he has also made significant contributions to the foundation as a member of our science executive committee. We are thrilled to welcome you all to today's event and to be part of celebrating Dr. Lieberman's most recent book. You can visit us at leakeyfoundation.org uh, and learn more about the Leakey Foundation. Daniel Lieberman, as well as how you can help support this research and our other educational programs. Thank you. All right, so now I am delighted to introduce tonight's speaker. Paleoanthropologist Daniel Lieberman is the Edwin M. Lerner Professor of Biological Sciences and Professor of Human Evolutionary Biology at Harvard University. A graduate from Harvard himself, he is the author of the previous books, 
the evolution of the human head and the national bestseller, The Story of the Human Body, Evolution, Health and Disease. As described by Camilla, his research is on how and why the human body is the way it is and the relevance of human evolution to contemporary health. Tonight, he is discussing his latest book, Exercised, praised by NPR as exceptionally informative and highly appealing. They write, quote, Lieberman makes a superb guide for anyone wishing to understand why it can be hard to commit to exercising and why we should do it anyway. And one of our former science book talk speakers, Neil Shubin, calls the book part user manual for the human body and part detective story exploring our evolution, celebrating how exercise will change the way that you think about exercise, diet, and your own well being. We are so grateful to have Daniel Lieberman virtually here with us tonight. So without further ado, Dan, the virtual podium is yours. Uh Thank you so much, Kate, and it's a real pleasure to be here. Let me see if, uh, I'm sorry we can't be in the same room, uh, but uh, I guess such is the nature of, uh, of life in the pandemic here. So let me share my screen and uh, let's see if this works. So uh, once again, um, thank you so much for this opportunity and um, I'm really pleased to, uh, to be here thanks to the, the Leakey Foundation, the Harvard Bookstore, the, the Division of Science, the Harvard Library to talk about um, exercise why something we never evolved to do is healthy and rewarding. And, and by the way, today is the, today is the day the book came out in the US. So this is kind of our, our kind of big launch party. So, so thank you so much for being here. Really, really grateful. And, um, and if um, I just want to start off with the observation that if, if the audience here is kind of representative of the US as a whole, we can guess that about 20% of you um, get your sort of recommended minimal dose of physical activity. The US government, the World Health Organization, so basically everybody in every sort of medical organization on the planet suggests that we get 150 minutes of exercise a week. And it turns out only about 20% of Americans succeed in doing that. So that means the other 80% of us hate it, right? And, um, and we're and many of them, as we know from, from interviews and from data are ambivalent about physical activity and exercise. They're confused, they feel anxious, they feel bullied in the world, they feel they feel exercised about exercise. And so, so, you know, for them and for many other people, I think there's a kind of degree of trepidation when you approach a book or a talk about exercise. I mean, we're all kind of sick of, you know, easy, you know, seven steps to, to running a marathon kinds of books. And I, and, you know, much as I could probably make a lot more money by doing that, I promise that that's not what we're going to be doing today. Uh, and nor that is what my book about is about. Instead, what I'd really like to do is to try to inform uh, us all about more about, about what exercise is and its evolutionary history with the goal of making us less exercised about this topic. But before I go any further, uh, first things first, uh, there are a lot of people I'd like to thank. Um, and I especially want to thank my phenomenal editor, Errol McDonald at Random House. Um, he's got really high standards and I've tried to live up to them. Um, my, my agent, Max Brockman, has been just superlative. And there are many, many, many dear and wonderful colleagues who have read many chapters of this book and commented and helped in all kinds of ways. I don't have time to read them all and I probably left some of off, off this list, um, but I really want to thank each and every one of them. They've, they've really helped uh, this book come along uh, enormously, uh, especially uh, my wife, Tonya, who read every chapter uh, and my running buddy, Dr. Aaron Baggish, who's also uh, worked really hard uh, helping me on this. He often overruns in the morning. Okay, so for the next 30 minutes or so, what I'd like to do is first talk about why I wrote this book and, and what it's about. And then the second uh, part of the talk, I'd like to use sort of the structure of the book to, um, to talk about some of the myths of exercise. And, and we'll, it'll be kind of a rapid and sort of cursory tour of, of what's obviously a much more uh, in-depth uh, book. So first let's talk about how this book started. So, you know, sometimes uh, things really do have an origin. And, and I can say that the origin of this book began in 2012 when I was finishing up my last book, The Story of the Human Body. And, and I was really lucky to get invited to probably one of the best junkets on the planet. I was invited, to, there's a medical uh, conference that precedes the Ironman World Championship every year in Kona, Hawaii. And, and I got invited to this amazing conference, um, which basically takes place over a week. And this is the view from the conference uh, 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 hotel. So you can see it's not a, not, a, not a tough place to spend a week. And um, now I wasn't there to participate in the race. I was there to observe it and, and to participate in this medical conference. And if you've ever seen a full Ironman, it's an extraordinary thing to see, right? So first of all, they do a 2.4 mile open water swim. Just, just saying that gives me heart palpitations. And then they, they jump off their, you know, jump out of the water and jump onto bikes and do just a, 
you know, a trivial kind of 112 mile bicycle uh, race across the, the lava fields of, of, of Kona. Um, and then when they get back, it's already about 90 degrees Fahrenheit. So they, they add a marathon, right? A full 26.2 mile marathon. It's an extraordinary thing to watch. And if you see that, you really understand why the motto of Iron Man is anything is possible. And, and uh, for the year I, I was there in 2012, this is the guy who won that year. Uh, he's basically a cyborg, not really a human being. He, he managed to do all that in just a little bit over eight hours. And he looks kind of fresh as a daisy actually when he crossed the finish line. But the really exciting moments in, in the race occur at the end because you have to finish by midnight to, to, consider, to be considered a finisher. And this was the last finisher uh, of the year, uh, of that year. Her name was Harriet Anderson. She was 77 years old and she did it in just under 17 hours. And here she is being greeted um, by, the, by the woman's winner. Um, and you, so you can just, you know, it's just a marvelous thing to watch the ability of human beings to do this kind of extreme endurance, especially in, in eight hours or, or for that matter, at the age of 77. So, but would I ever wanna do that? No way, no way in hell. I mean, I, I, I left Kona thinking, that is not for me, especially the swimming part. No, no way would I do that. And then when I got home, again, remember, I'm just finishing up this book on, on, the, on, on the evolution of the human body. And I've been thinking about, you know, about health and whatever. But then very, a few weeks later, I packed my bags and I was off again on another trip, this time to Northern Mexico to do some research with the Tarahumara. So this is in the Sierra Tarahumara. This is actually a photograph I took on that trip. It's one of the most beautiful places I've ever been on the planet, but it's extremely remote. With my friend, help of my, my, my colleague and friend, Mickey Mahaffey, we were basically driving on these little, you know, up these roads into these crazy, very, very, very remote areas and, and this two by four and, and, and sleeping on floors of Pueblos. And I was measuring people's feet and studying people's running. And, um, uh, but I have to say though, although the Taramar are extremely famous for running, I never saw anybody running unless I paid them to do that until I got a chance to see one of their famous races, actually two of their famous races. So there's a there's a, both a men's race and a woman's race, and the men's race is called Arara Hippery, and it's uh, it's kind of like a marathon combined with kind of soccer. There's a little tiny little wooden ball. Actually, I've got one over here. You can see it, but it's a little wooden ball, and they flick it with their feet, and then they um, and then they um, and then they and then they chase it, and then they kick it again, and then they ch chase it, and they kick it again. And they do this sometimes for up to 50 or 60 miles. And there are two teams and the team that laps the other one eventually wins. It's, it's an extraordinary uh, race to watch. There's also a woman's race, which, uh, which is also just spectacular. It's called an ariwete. Instead of a ball, they have a, a hoop, a cloth hoop, and they use these sticks to flick them. And usually those races last about, about just a marathon. <laughs> and uh, so I got a chance to see these amazing races. Um, um, but other than that, I didn't see anybody running ever, um, uh, unless I paid them. So there I was traveling around and I was thinking about Iron Man and these incredible people and all this, all the sort of pain and suffering they put them through themselves through. And then I saw this, this wonderful, beautiful race, um, races that are also kind of similar in terms of endurance and difficulty, but very different in some ways and very similar in other ways. Uh, anyway, but I was also measuring people's feet and I was talking to people and I was had my little, you know, I was being a good anthropologist and I had my set of questions and I was asking everybody about how much they ran and how they trained for running. And, Every time I asked anybody about how they trained, I had ran into trouble because uh, the, the translator I was working with kept struggling to explain what training was to, um, to the Taramara, but they don't actually have a word for training uh, in their culture. So she was explaining that, you know, this guy, this, this gringo who's talking to you, you know, he runs five miles every morning to kind of get fit. And, and then this one guy uh, who I'll call Ernesto, um, I'll never forget him because he was, uh, he was uh, I was told a very famous runner. And in fact, I got a chance to, to watch him running in the Thrower Hippery. And, uh, and when he, uh, when I asked him the question, he looked at me and he said, why would anybody run if they didn't have to? And I remember kind of laughing in embarrassment and then realized it makes sense, right? Uh, because um, for, for, for people like the Taramara and for that matter, for, for pretty much everybody until recently, people, people were very physically active but they didn't do what we would call exercise. So it's important to understand this distinction, right? Physical activity is any bodily movement produced by skeletal muscles that expends energy. It's basically moving, right? But exercise is discretionary. It's voluntary physical activity to sustain or improve health and fitness, right? You go to the gym to exercise. You go run five miles in the morning to exercise. But the Taro Mara, when they do their long distance runs, they don't think of it as a form of exercise. They actually think of it as a form of prayer. And to me, the apotheosis of exercise is the treadmill. I mean, think about it. 
you pay money either to buy one of these things or to go to a gym to use one of these things to work really, really hard. Uh, it's noisy, it's loud, it's, it's kind of treacherous, it's boring as hell, um, and it gets you nowhere, right? Um, try explaining that to, to like your great, great, great grandparents, like that you would actually spend your own hard-earned cash uh, to torture yourselves on, on one of these things. I, I, I generally hate treadmills, even though I put them on people on them for a living. Um, and uh, I had a, a sort of another sort of experience that kind of made me think about this because I work in, I've been for the last 12 years, I've been working in this community in Western Kenya called Pemja. And it's a beautiful place. It's way high up on the Western Rift Valley. In fact, you can see, I don't know if you can see in the photo there, but down in the distance, that's, a, that's Lake Victoria and that's the town of Kasumu. That's where uh, uh, Barack Obama's father was born. Anyway, in this area of Kenya, it's very, very rural and very poor. There's no electricity, there's no running water. Uh, there is no machines. People do all their labor by hand or with the help of, 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 of animals. Um, and, uh, and, and, and women especially carry huge loads all the time. They carry water, they carry firewood. So we were kind of interested in that. And so my graduate students and I and my Kenyan colleagues, so we decided to bring a treadmill up to the area and, and study uh, women while they were carrying loads on, the, on these treadmills you know, with, uh, with an oxygen uh, analysis system so we could measure how much energy they're spending. So we, we schlepped up, you know, I bought a treadmill and we schlepped this treadmill all the way up these dangerous, difficult roads. And I think you get a sense from this video of just how difficult the driving is there. But when we got there and, and put people on the treadmill, they had a hard time doing it. And you too would have a hard time walking on a treadmill if you had never walked on one before. It's a really weird, bizarre and strange thing. And, and people didn't really like it. And we realized that we had to abandon the treadmill and, and, and study people as they were walking overground. It was just a complete waste of time and money. And by the way, just so you know, uh, just to kind of add to my story about treadmills, did you know that the modern treadmill was basically invented uh, by uh, a guy named William Cubitt in the Victorian period uh, to punish prisoners because they were worried that people in debtors prisons and, and other prisons in England were, were relaxing and having too much fun. So they invented these treadmills to, to basically keep them, keep them trudging all day long and make them miserable. Oscar Wilde, for example, had to, had to trudge for about six hours a day on one of these treadmills. So if you hate a treadmill, there's a good reason. It has a history of people hating it. So how did I end up putting people on treadmills as this poor guy is in, in my lab and, and studying and writing about the evolution of human physical activity? Well, for me, it's actually a long and kind of interesting story because I, I'm by no means uh, the kind of person I would have ever associated with, uh, with, with exercise and physical activity when I was growing up. So here's me in I think sixth or seventh grade. Um, that's me in the in the little red circle there. I was a total nerd. I was very physically uh, uh, insecure. I wasn't very good at anything. I know it's a cliche, but I really was picked last for most teams uh, all the time. Uh, I once hid in, in a closet during gym, so I didn't have to go to, to gym class. I was the standard kind of you know, typical nerd. And um, But I had a, a wonderful role model. I didn't sort of realize it at the time, but my mother uh, this is my mother here. And by the way, my father, who's a great photographer, takes pictures all the time, but he doesn't have a single picture of her running. But, but my mother started running when, in 1969 when she was 33. This is really before the running boom because the University of Connecticut, where she was teaching at the time, built this fancy schmancy new gym and they wouldn't let women use it. And she ran with some friends to liberate the gym. And then she became hooked and she started running about five miles a day, which she did for about 50 decades. And she still exercises uh, regularly every day. And you know, I just thought, well, that's what mothers do, right? I didn't realize when I was a kid uh, how extraordinary and, and, and heroic she was. So I grew up with, with parents who, who were physically active. My father also ran with my mother. And on family holidays, we would, we would go hiking and skiing and stuff like that. So you know, we didn't really do sports, but, but my parents were certainly encouraged me to be physically active. So, so, uh, so I did have that kind of, of, of background, um, but I didn't really think about it very much, of course, until recently. And then I grew up and became a professor. And, and for, for much of my career, I was a head guy. I was focused on skulls. But I started studying, uh, getting interested in the problem of how humans, because we're bi bipeds, we, we walk and run on two legs, how it is that humans keep our heads still? Because remember, I'm a head guy, right? I'm a skull guy. How do we keep our heads still when we run? Because unlike animals like this pig, which can flex and extend its neck to keep its head stable, we're like pogo sticks. So it turns out, we have this, this interesting uh, structure called the nuchal ligament. And with my colleague, uh, Dennis Bramble, we started studying it. We started doing biomechanics in the lab and you know, taking people's heads off and making them run, as you can see from this video. And that got me interested in, in how people ran um, back in, in the old days. 
And in 2004, uh, Dennis Bramble and I published this uh, paper in Nature, which, is, which was uh, on the cover of Nature said, uh, Born to Run. Of course, the actual title of the paper was much more academic. And, um, and you know, we spent many years writing that paper, but the basic argument of the paper was that humans evolved to be long distance runners. And that running is in addition to walking was important in human evolution. And of course, if humans evolved to run millions of years ago, they must have been running barefoot because shoes were only invented recently. So we then start, I then started studying uh, barefoot running and that led to another paper in nature. And then soon thereafter, uh, I wrote the book, The Story of the Human Body, which is really um, um, about, about how and why our bodies are the way they are. And, um, and of course, the fact that I was studying running got me interested more in my own running. So I was a bit of a jogger, you know, following my mother. I would, in high school, I would run occasionally in, 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 the, in the streets near our house. And in college, I would occasionally do a, you know, a short little loop around the Charles River when I was an undergraduate, but I was never a serious runner. And it wasn't until I started working on this paper on the evolution of running that I really started to seriously up my running. And in 2007, uh, I thought I'd better put my money where my mouth was. So I actually ran my first marathon and I've become a bit of an addict of, ever since. And I've done, done now uh, 24, I believe. Um, and then I, because I like to tr try what I study, I also tried barefoot running and I, I thought I should try running against animals. So I, instead of you know, hunting a kudu in Africa, I, I joined this race in Prescott, Arizona called Man Against Horse. And I basically had a wonderful time over the last, uh, last uh, 15 years or so, uh, really enjoying running. And, but but I, 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 when I got into this, I really had no idea uh, how, what the kind of controversy uh, I was going to get involved with. Now, you know, paleoanthropology is famous for controversy, but oh, you should try barefoot running if you want to try controversy, right? So to, to my astonishment, when we started publishing about barefoot running, I, 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 was, I was sort of caught between these two worlds. So there was this one group of folks who was arguing that, that basically shoes are evil and they're like coffins for your feet and barefoot running is better. And then there was a whole, another group of folks who were arguing that, that barefoot running is, is, is bad for you. And like you know, anybody who, doesn't, who runs barefoot is like a, you know, probably a polygamist or some communist or something like that. And, and, every, and most people were just completely confused. And it made me realize that so many people are just exercised about exercise, right? Now the word exercised means to be vexed, worried, anxious, and harassed. And, and for example, in terms of the barefoot running debate, people were wondering, you know, is it better to run barefoot or not? You know, will running ruin my knees? How much should I run? But there are also so, so many other questions I was hearing, you know, how do I get myself to exercise in the first place? How much weight should I do? How much cardio should I do? And, you know, how much sleep should I get? And is, you know, is, is my chair out to kill me? And, and so on and so on, you know, I think we're, we're really extremely exercised in this country about exercise. But of course, the biggest problem of all is that most people aren't really getting enough exercise, right? Now, and everybody knows every, you know, that exercise is healthy. I mean, we've known that for thousands of years. Every culture on the planet knows that. And yet we struggle to get enough, right? According to the CDC and various other kind of organizations that kind of track this, only about 20% of Americans get the recommended minimum dose of exercise that, uh, that we are considered recommended to get. I'll talk more about that dose a little bit later on, but that's 150 minutes a week of moderate exercise um, and, and, or 75 minutes a week of vigorous exercise. So that to me raises some questions, like why are we so exercised about exercise? Well, I think one reason is that we're confused, right? We're, we're, we're constantly barraged with, with, with kind of contradictory information that, that, that as often creates kind of whiplash. Like, so one day you can read just about how wonderful running is for you. And then the next day you can read about, you know, runners getting, you know, dying like Pheidippides at the end of the marathon, right? And, and then, you know, another day you can read about how important aerobic physical activity is for your health. And another day you can read about how important it is to do weights and weights, you know, prevent aging. And, 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 and people just don't know really how to make sense of all this, uh, these little bits of information that are often uh, disjointed and, and often contradictory. I think another really big problem is that, is that so much of the lens that we use to evaluate exercise has to do with weight loss. And that sort of makes sense because a lot of people in this country are, are, uh, are struggling to lose weight, but, but, but weight loss is not the only raison d'etre to, to, to run or, 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 or walk or, or swim or cycle or whatever it is you like to do. And, and it, it gives us a very narrow perspective on, on, on exercise. We'll talk a bit more about that later on. And then the other extreme is that we talk a lot about elite athletes, right? The fastest, the strongest, you know, these amazing people. But, but I can tell you that most of these folks have very little to do with, with, with you and me um, in, terms of, in terms of how their, uh, you know, their physiology and its effects on their health. 
um, uh, it's, it's, to me, it's a bit akin to, to focusing too much on, 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 on sort of supermodels instead of normal people when we think about what's a normal human body. But I think that the kind of the, the biggest problem is that we have a very Western post-industrial bias. Almost all the data that we have about physical activity comes from people from America and Europe. So about 80% of the data, according to a study that we recently did. And yet that represents only a sliver of humanity. The other 90% of the world uh, um, is very different. And of course, for most of human evolution, people have lived very differently from the lives that we live today. And so I thought it would be a useful and interesting and fun and rewarding experience to try to write a natural history of physical activity. And there are sort of two mantras that run through uh, this book. The first is that nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. And that's because we weren't designed, we weren't engineered, we evolved. And if you understand, understand why our bodies are the way they are, you need to understand that evolutionary history. But also we're humans, right? And humans have culture and we're complicated. And, and if you want to understand human behavior, you need to think about, about human behavior in the light of anthropology. And so the book is uh, organized in, as a kind of natural history. Um, because, of course, if you want to understand physical activity, you also have to understand physical inactivity. So I begin the book with a natural sort of history and evolutionary history of physical inactivity, like sitting and, 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 and sleeping and resting. Then, because uh, we originally evolved to be fast and strong, uh, I look at, uh, I look at uh, the evolution of speed and strength. And then, because there was important selection in human evolution for endurance, especially, uh, uh, I think, running, uh, but also walking, I, that we next talk about endurance. And then the final part of the book uh, applies uh, parts one through three to health uh, today and how exercise works in the modern world. And so I've tried to weave together uh, in, information from anthropology and from evolutionary biology, and human biology and health sciences, but because that, you know, that's just kind of tedious reading and also try to kind of make it personal, I've tried to weave throughout the book my own experiences because I spent the last 20 years as trying to get as much uh, experience as possible um, uh, in traveling around the world and seeing how people use their bodies. And, and, and you know, so I've been to, you know, of course, racing against horses and my, the work I've been doing in Africa. And I got a chance to go hunting uh, in Greenland and the work in Mexico and the work in the lab, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I wanted to kind of weave that throughout the book as a kind of a narrative. So, so the book has four sections, uh, inactivity, speed and strength, endurance and health. Um, and uh, each of these has, has you know, chapters on, on particular uh, 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 aspects of physical activity or inactivity. Uh, but as a way of kind of uh, addressing the fact that people are so exercised about exercise, I also added to each chapter a discussion of various myths about speed and strength and resting and sitting and sleeping and walking and running and aging, et cetera. And so as a kind of a, a way to sort of have a kind of a quick look through the book, I thought it would be fun uh, to kind of talk about some of those, some of those myths. And, and I'll, I'll sort of just zoom through a few, uh, obviously very briefly. And of course, it's just a, it's kind of like a, a glimpse of, 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 of what I talk about. So the first section of the book, as I said before, is about physical inactivity. Because if you want to understand what physical activity is about, we also need to understand what we're doing most of the day, which is being inactive, right? You can't exercise all day long. That's just not possible. In fact, it's not normal. So, and for me, the biggest myth of all uh, about physical activity and about exercise is that we evolved to exercise. In fact, I call this the myth of the, of the athletic savage because we get this idea uh, from, from, from some popular literature and, 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 and other places that our ancestors were these just amazing athletes, right? You know, they were, they were walking long distances every day. They were carrying huge objects. They were digging and climbing and running and dancing. And all that is true, except it turns out that if you look at how much physical activity hunter-gatherers were doing, we realize this starting in the 1970s when people were doing research in the Kalahari, that hunter-gatherers actually only sort of active for a few hours a day. In fact, recent uh, research on the Hadza in Tanzania shows that their, the average Hadza engages in about two and a quarter hours of physical activity every day that's sort of moderate or vigorous. And for the rest of the day, like us, they mostly rest and, and they're physically active only when it's necessary or when it's rewarding. So the idea that, that people were out there, you know, working crazy hard all day long, you know, like a kind of like a CrossFit workout is just simply uh, not true. And so next time you're in, in an ele in, a, in a mall or an airport or a subway station like this, right? And you and you and you a little voice in your in your head, like all these people, right, is telling you, take the escalator, right? 
Um, and of course, you know, we didn't evolve in environments that had escalators, but that little voice that's telling you, you know, to, to kind of, uh, to save energy and, you know, and, and, to, and to, you know, not, not spend energy on, on needless physical activity, that's a deep and ancient instinct. And so I think we should realize, we should be compassionate about, about that, that little voice, right? That these folks here in a way are being completely normal, right? They're, they're avoiding unnecessary physical activity. Um, whereas this person here, who I, by the way, photoshopped onto this, um, is, is kind of abnormal, right? She's, she's, um, she's, she's voluntarily spending extra calories. Um, and, and in a zero sum game, when calories are, 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 are rare, uh, that's, that's energy that we're not spending on other important functions. So another sort of thing, I, another aspect of physical activity is like when you're, when you're physically inactive, what are you doing? Well, most of the time you're sitting and, and, and you've probably heard the phrase that sitting is the new smoking. And there's a lot of public ad campaigns out there trying to, trying to get us to sit less. But, but think about it, you can't exercise all day long. And when you're not exercising, what's more natural than sitting? And in fact, it turns out uh, that when people go to, uh, to hunter-gatherer camps, this is actually the photo I took when I first walked into this particular camp, that people sit about nine to 10 hours a day. And, um, and you know, uh, if you go to like most Americans, uh, that's what, and apparently Russians too, that's what they're doing, right? Uh, by the way, I just love this photo of, of, of Trump and Putin. They look so bored, right? Uh, it's, uh, they're, clearly, uh, they're clearly not having a great time. Um, so, so, so it turns out that, you know, we sit pretty much as much as, 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 as hunter-gatherers who don't even own chairs. Uh, so, um, um, and that's not to say that sitting uh, has uh, no uh, health negative consequences. And it turns out there are better and worse ways to sit. But it turns out that really it's leisure time sitting uh, that's most uh, strongly associated with negative health outcomes. So if you, sit, if you sit all day at work and then you go home and sit all evening, well then, then of course you're in trouble. But, but sitting nine to 10 hours a day is a perfectly normal uh, thing to do. And then I was thinking, well, if we're told to sit less, why are we also told to sleep more? And so I, I ended up sort of really um, delving into the, into the bi evolutionary biology of sleep. And it was fascinating because it turns out that this idea that we have that, that you know, now in the modern world with electricity and iPhones and television and, and you know, all kinds of other uh, you know, doodads that prevent us from sleeping, uh, that, that, you know, that, that we now sleep less than we used to, that turns out not to be true because when, when anthropologists go out into parts of the world where, where there, are no, there is no electricity and there are no iPhones and there is no television, it turns out that people don't sleep uh, any more than we do, right? They turn out, turns out that, that you could put monitors on them. They sleep between about 5.7 and 7.1 hours a night, which is actually not too different from, from most Americans. And it is true that if you don't get enough sleep, that has serious negative health consequences. But it's also untrue that eight hours is, 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 is actually optimal. Uh, this is a graph based on uh, data from millions of people, right? Of, of the relationship between how, much hours they, how many hours they sleep um, versus uh, their ratio of heart disease. And it turns out that the, uh, for, it's a U-shaped curve for both men and women. And for most people, the optimum seems to be around seven. So, so this idea that eight hours is absolutely necessary is, is just uh, is not true. And, but the problem is that we then make people exercised about it, right? We tell it, people think that they're not getting enough sleep and then they get stressed about it and stress elevates cortisol. And cortisol is, the, is, a, is a hormone that makes you aroused and then therefore prevents you from sleeping. So I think we need to be, you know, while sleep is a serious issue, we should be a little bit, um, maybe a little bit less prescriptive about it. Okay, so that's inactivity. Part two of the book is about speed and strength. And one of the, uh, the trade off, the, the myths that is very common is that there's a strong trade off between speed and endurance, right? You can either be a, a, a tortoise or you can be a hare. And you know that's a perfect example of our bias on elite athletes. So here's Elliot Kipchoge on the left. He's the world's fastest marathoner. And here's Usain Bolt, who's now retired, but he's the world's fastest 100 meter sprinter. And, and Kipchoge is running a marathon at 5.9 meters a second. That's like a 440 mile. And he can do that in about two hours. Bolt is blazing along at an incredible speed for a human, not so fast for a quadruped, at about 10.4 meters a second. So he can run 100 meters in 9.58 seconds. So if Kipchoge were to run at 100 meters at his pace, he'd run a 1657. And if, and if Bolt were to run a marathon at his pace, he'd run a blisteringly fast 107 marathon. But of course they can't do that. So there is a trade-off for Truett for elite athletes, but for the rest of us, it turns out that trade-off doesn't exist, right? Think about soccer players. They're really good at speed and they're all really good at endurance. And the same is true for decathletes and actually for most people, right? Uh, for most people, it turns out there is no trade-off between speed and endurance. And, and over the last few years, we've been learning more and more about, about um, 
about high intensity interval training where you basically do short little bouts of, of high intensity exercise. And it turns out that one of the major benefits of HIIT, high intensity interval training, is it builds your endurance. So for most of us, there is no trade-off between speed and endurance. They're actually complementary. Another myth out there is that we evolved to be super strong, right? This is like the, you know, the CrossFit myth, right? Their you know, primal fitness myth, right? You know, their ancestors were out there heaving rocks, right? But it turns out that's also is not true. And when people have, you know, anthropologists have gone out and measured hunter-gatherers, they're, they're reasonably strong. In fact, this is a, this is a measure of, for example, grip strength among, 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 among people in, in the UK. And you can see the hunter-gatherers, um, this is an average, uh, tend to be about 75th percentile. So they're, you know, they're reasonably strong, but they're not crazy strong. But the key thing about, 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 um, about strength in, in hunter-gatherers is that because they continue to use their bodies to, to, to generate force and power, uh, they tend to maintain their strength more um, as they age. So by the time they're uh, in their 80s, um, they have, they're actually close to the 90th percentile for, 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 for 80 year old Englishmen. And there's a reason for that, and that's use it or lose it, right? Muscle's really expensive. You spend as much energy just taking care of your muscle if you're just sitting in bed as you, as you, as you spend on your brain. It's about 20% of your metabolism. And so extra muscle is a lot of extra energy and you don't wanna have any more muscle uh, than you need. And then a final myth about sort of strength and, and speed and, and power is, that, is this myth that sports are exercise. If you think about the Olympics, for example, the, most of the, of the, of the, of the, of the Olympic uh, uh, events, especially back in the old Olympics, were really about skills that were important for combat. They were, they were about you know, javelin throwing and wrestling and well, chariot racing, which we don't do anymore. Um, and, and so many sports around the world. In fact, I described this, uh, this incredible uh, sport you see, can still see in Florence, the Calcio Florentino and, and, in, and you know, football, et cetera. These are, these are sports that are still kind of retain uh, a kind of a combat uh, 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 flavor to them. And, and I think that one of the, the main reasons that, uh, that sports are a human universal, every, every culture has sports of one sort or another, is not so much uh, to, to get people to be physically active, but rather to treat, train people to be warriors, but also to train people um, to not to be reactively aggressive. So as my colleague Richard Rangham has written about, there's sort of two kinds of aggression. Reactive aggression, which is like when you just, without thinking, you know, respond to uh, aggressively to something and proactive aggression, which is voluntarily in control. And in sports, we teach people to be good sports, right? Not to be reactively aggressive. It's not acceptable, you know, to beat up uh, an opponent if they score a goal against you, uh, but it is okay uh, to, to, to work together to, to beat the other team. Okay, so part three of the book is uh, moves on to endurance uh, because I think this is really probably the most special aspect of human physical activity. And if there's any one sort of most fundamental aspect of, of human sort of physical activity, it's to walk, right? We are walkers and we evolved to walk about 7 million years ago when we split from the chimpanzees. Walking is the most fundamental form of physical activity and hunter gatherers, so of course, until a few hundred generations ago, everybody was a hunter gatherer. Hunter gatherers walk between six and nine miles a day, right? So that's like, that's like walking from LA to New York City every year. And so walking is important, but recently there's been a kind of trend uh, uh, to think about sort of walking as being kind of useless for, for weight loss, right? Um, and there's some basis to this, right? If you walk a mile, you spend about 50 extra calories. But if you eat a, uh, some fries from at McDonald's, you're gonna get about 365 calories. So, so clearly you have, to, you have to walk a lot to, to make up for, uh, for just one, uh, for one serving of fries. And, and you know, the average American who's trying to lose weight is trying to lose about 50 pounds. And, and remember the, the average recommendation for physical activity is 150 minutes a week. And if you exercise 150 minutes a week, well, your weight loss is gonna be very modest for the reasons I just explained. You know, it's just not that much energy is spent by walking. So if you, if you do 150 minutes a week, you might lose a half a pound in a month and you might lose, if you're lucky, about you know, six pounds in a year. But remember, that's just 21 minutes a day of walking, right? And it turns out if you look at slightly more evolutionary doses, like, like just doubling that to 30, 300 minutes a week, so that's, that's 42 minutes a day, turns out you can lose a pound a month and you can lose about 12 pounds a year. So it's not true that uh, walking uh, can't uh, help you lose weight. It's just that you're not gonna lose a lot of it really fast and you have to have reasonably you know, large amounts of walking. Although I don't think 300 minutes a week is that crazy. But even more importantly, the important benefit of physical activity is not so much for weight loss. If you really wanna lose weight, the best thing to do is diet because you can, you can really go to, into much more negative energy balance, cut your calories much more 
by, by, by restricting your food intake than by exercising. But what's really important about physical activity is it prevents weight gain or weight regain. And of course, uh, many, many diets fail, not because people can't lose weight while dieting, it's just that after they finish dieting, they gain the weight back. So here's an example of a study on this. This is actually done on Boston policemen. They had a bunch of policemen. They had them, some of them dieted, some of them dieted and exercised. The ones who exercised lost a little bit more weight than the ones who just dieted. And then after the eight weeks of, of diet, when they all lost about, about, uh, about 10 to 12 kilos, the ones who didn't exercise gained all their weight back. But the ones who continued to exercise managed to keep the weight off. And so that's really, I think, what's so important about physical activity when it comes to, to weight loss. So if walking is the most basic, fundamental, moderate form of physical activity, running is by far the most basic and fundamental form of vigorous physical activity. That's right. We evolved to run long distances. And uh, much of the book is, I have a large section of the book to talk about that because that's a, that's a big interest of mine. But there's another myth out there about running, which is that it's going to destroy your knees, right? It's like a wear and tear. It's going to cause you, cause you to wear down your, the cartilage your knees, just like, you know, wearing down the the, you know, the, the springs in your car. And that turns out to be also false, right? Well, it, so, well in, a, in a complicated way. So it's true that the knee is the most common site of injury for running, uh, but it is not true. And there are many prospective studies which show that, uh, that, that people who run are not more likely uh, to get arthritis in their knee. In fact, uh, if anything, they're slightly less likely to get running uh, injuries in their knee. And in fact, uh, I talk about this in the book is that I think a lot of these knee injuries that are people are getting are because running is a skill. And, um, and we don't teach people to run very well anymore. Um, and, and, and also people don't have bodies that are well adapted to the stresses caused by running when they take up running. So they end up running poorly, overdoing it, and, and then result is they, they get injuries. But the good news is that if you learn to run properly and you do it sensibly, you can learn to run well, healthily for a long time without, without destroying your knees. And that brings up the final kind of endurance, which is that, um, which is really endurance over time. And, you know, um, we have this idea that as we get older, it's kind of normal to be less active, right? Um, you know, it's like retirement, right? We you know, get kind of get to your 60s, your 70s, you kind of be a little less active, you move to Florida, hang out on the beach. But remember, in the, in the, in the, in the Stone Age, there was no retirement. And, and by the way, it's a misconception that people died young uh, in the Paleolithic. Uh, we, we have pretty good evidence that if, if you survive childhood, uh, hunter-gatherers typically live into their 70s, right? So they live nearly as long as, as people in, 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 in countries like the United States. And the important thing is that as hunter-gatherers age, they don't become less active. In fact, they often become more active. This is a graph of how much time per day people spend foraging at different ages. These are our, our mothers and these are grandmothers. And you can see that grandmothers are actually spending more time out there foraging. And what they're doing is that their humans evolved uh, you may have heard of the grandparent hypothesis to, 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 um, to, to, to supply food to their children and their grandchildren. But remember, they didn't just like, you know, give them checks, right? They were out there hunting and gathering and getting food, which they would then supply uh, to their children and their grandchildren. And importantly, that physical activity turns on all kinds of repair and maintenance mechanisms. So it turns out that the older we are, the more we benefit from physical activity. And there's no study that's probably more famous in this regard than the, fame, than, the, than, the, than the Harvard alumni study, which was done by Ralph Paffenbarger. So Paffenbarger figured out, um, and any of you are, are alums of, the, of any university, including Harvard, that, that your university is never going to let you go, right? They're constantly contacting their alumni, begging them for money. And so he realized this is a perfect opportunity to study, to study aging. And so he, he got the Alumni Association to let him uh, get, uh, collect data on the alumni about how much physical activity they were doing. And then he waited till various alumni died. This is a study of more than 21,000 individuals. And you can see that, and then he plotted physical activity on the, on the x-axis. So these are people getting 500, 500 to 2,000 and more than 2,000 calories a week of exercise against their, their all-cause death rate. And so these are people in their 20s to 50s, their 50s, their 60s, and their 70s. And you can see that if you normalize the death rate to the sedentary individuals to a death rate of one, but it, when you're when you're in 20s and 30s and 40s, uh, if you're exercising a lot, you lower your death rate by about 21 percent. But by the time you get into your into your 70s, right, you're lowering your death rate by 50 percent. So the older you get, the more of the, ben the more of benefit you get in terms of in terms of health and, and, and longevity. And that brings up the final portion of the book, 
which is to talk about health. And of course, the biggest problem is how do you actually get help people exercise, right? And the approach that we've taken in our world today is to commercialize and industrialize that, uh, physical activity as well as to med medicalize it. We sell it and we prescribe it. And, and the proof is in the pudding. It, you know, it helps some people, but for the, obviously for the vast majority of Americans, this approach isn't really working. And I would argue that we should take an evolutionary and anthropological approach. Remember, the reason that people were physically active for most of human evolutionary history were for two reasons. One was when it was necessary, and the other was when it was rewarding. And of course, the, the times when it's most rewarding, think about those Taramara runners, is when they're doing it for some kind of social reason, right? In the case of the Taramara, they're doing it because their, 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 their long distance races are a form of prayer. So, um, so I think we can learn a lot about how to, we can help people be more physically active. And I discussed that by, by applying uh, these, 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 these principles. Another question that is often on people's minds is like, how much should I do, right? What type should I do, right? And, and, and again, when we you take a kind of medicalized approach, there's no one answer, right? And why could there be, right? Because it depends on who you are and what your, what your, kind of, what your background is and what your, what your goals are. Are you worried about Alzheimer's or heart disease or, or just simply what age you are going to live to, and 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 um, and furthermore, like what's the right dose? There is no one dose. So uh, this is an interesting uh, 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 illustration of that. This is a, a graph based on more than a million Americans, and what it shows is uh, how much moderate to vigorous physical activity people get a week, so minutes a week, against their relative risk of death adjusted for age. And you can see if you if you don't exercise at all, your relative risk of death is about one, right? But if you get just 60 minutes of exercise a week of just moderate to vigorous acti activity a week, you can lower your, 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 your risk of death by about 40%. If you do 150 minutes a week, so that's just 21 minutes a day, you, you approximate about a 50% reduction. And that's where this 150 minutes recommendation comes from. But if you do you know, 320 minutes a week, well, you get even more benefit and 500 gets you even more benefit. And of course, eventually uh, it tails off. So the answer is there is no one dose, right? Um, and there is no one uh, a, a type or kind to do. You wanna mix it up, um, some is better than none. And if you wanna do more, you're gonna get more benefit from it, but eventually those benefits diminish. And then finally, I think we need to stop uh, making the claim that exercise is a magic bullet against disease. Now there is no question that exercise lowers the risk of many common diseases, right? It, it helps prevent obesity. It's important for preventing heart disease, for respiratory tract infections. We have no data yet on COVID, but I'll, I'll make a bet that like for other respiratory tract infections, physical activity helps improve your immune system. Uh, we know that there's compelling data that physical activity reduces your, your risk of cancer. Uh, it's by far the best way of preventing Alzheimer's, uh, type two diabetes. It has perfective effects for arthritis, for osteoporosis, for depression. The list is long. And in, my, in the final chapter of the book, I go through every single one of these diseases and explain what those mechanisms are and what the, what the, what the, what the, what the evidence is and, and what the doses are and all that kind of stuff. But, but, but the point I wanna make is that although physical activity lowers the risk of many of these diseases, you can still get them even if you exercise, obviously. And, and really it's not that exercise is a form of medicine, it's rather that it's the absence of physical activity that increases your vulnerability to these diseases, right? So if, it's not that exercise, we, we, we say that exercise prevents heart disease, but a really a better way of saying it is that a lack of physical activity makes you much more vulnerable, much more likely to get heart disease. And it's an important distinction. And hopefully um, that chapter will help you uh, understand that and why it's important. So to conclude, I hope that the book entertains and informs and enlightens. And I, what I really wanna do is to change the way we think about exercise in particular and about the science of health in general in our, in our, in our, in our culture. I think we've oversimplified things. I think we're, we're, we're very, some of the data we use is highly biased towards Westerners and elite athletes and towards weight loss. I think we've, you know, there's nothing wrong with commercializing and medicalizing exercise, but we've, we've gone way too far in those, in those directions. I think we're very often judgmental and uncompassionate about people who are struggling to exercise when it's after all an abnormal and difficult thing to do. And then finally, I hope the book is useful, right? Just as for Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who managed to make it to 87, uh, in large part by, by, by being a gym rat and, 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 you know, not crazy amounts of physical activity, um, that hopefully that, that the information in the book can, can help people make exercise fun and, and how it would also make it necessary and how, how and why it can be healthy and rewarding. And, but most fervently, 
I hope that, um, that the book helps people enjoy being active, um, but helps prevent us from being exercised about it. So uh, thank you. And I look forward to, to answering some questions. Thank you so much, Dan. That was absolutely wonderful. We've had a lot of great questions, so I'm going to get right into it so we have time for them. Okay. Um, Barbara asks, what exercise is best to strengthen your brain? <laughs> um, again, this is part of this kind of prescriptive thing. We all want to know like what to do. Um, I, I'm not an Alzheimer's expert, and there are, of course, many different kinds of, 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 of neurological issues. Um, I think it's pretty clear that, that moderate uh, cardio is really helpful for, for many aspects of brain health, and, uh, and, and, and moderate exercise is good, and there, but there's some evidence that, that vigorous exercise can even have extra benefits. Um, there's there's, a, there's a, lots of effects of physical activity on the brain. One of the most important is that physical, physical activity upregulates a molecule called BDNF, brain-derived neurotropic growth factor, which is a mouthful, but basically it's like miracle growth for the brain. And it, it helps protect the neurons in the brain and the cells that protect the neurons. And uh, it has been shown to have all kinds of wonderful benefits. But there are other important benefits of physical activity on the brain. Um, one of them is, uh, uh, it, it's, you know, as I said before, it helps lower Alzheimer's and, 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 and so on. It's, 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 it's again, it's always the same answer, really. It's, you know, some is better than none and more is probably a little bit better. And, uh, but there's, there's no one simple prescription. All right, um, we have a great question from Ruben Rodriguez who asks, um, you mentioned running as a form of prayer. Have you learned anything related to the runner's high? Any anthropological oh. or evolutionary reason? Yeah, so. I do have a whole section on runner's high in the book. Um, so runner's high is actually caused primarily by endocannabinoids. So they're basically, you know, marijuana-like compounds, which your brain, your body produces when you're, when you're doing long distance, you know, long duration physical activity. So you can't get it in a few minutes. You have to kind of get out there for, a few, for an hour or two. Um, and the cool thing about, about, about runner's high is that your body not only produces more, um, more endocannabinoids, but your body also produces more receptors. You get like a super dose. And um, I think, and I, I hypothesize in the book that, um, that the runner's high evolved um, to help people be foragers and hunters, right? If you're out there, think about when you're high, right? Um, I'm sure a lot of this, you know, being a Cambridge audience, a lot of people have, have some experience with this, but you have heightened sensory awareness, right? Blue becomes bluer and you know, your, 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 your sensory perception is enhanced, right? And that can be really useful when you're hunting, right? You're looking for cues, you're looking for, for tracks, you're looking for information and you guess all that information comes in, it makes you feel good. And uh, so I believe that, uh, that the runner's high uh, evolved to help us uh, be uh, in heightened sensory awareness when we're doing physical activity, which in turn, but also to give us some, some positive feedback and, and dopamine. And there's other kind of good stuff that happens when you exercise, you get dopamine, which is like a molecule of more, it makes you, gives you a reward. There's, 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 um, there's serotonin and, and epinephrine and all kinds of good stuff happens when you exercise that makes you happy. Opioids, um, lots, lots of good things going on. So um, we have a lot, of, a lot of duplicate questions. People are curious about the same topic. So I'm gonna run through those so I can make as many people happy as possible here. Um, you, touched on a, you touched on a hot topic. Uh, so Mark asks, Dr. Lieberman, thank you for your excellent talk. You mentioned the prior fad of barefoot minimalist running. Where do you personally stand? <laughs> <laughs> I think, it, look, I think, you know, it's fun to run. And the reason I do it occasionally is because it's fun, right? But it's not a panacea. It's not going to cure. It's not a cure all. I think you can learn from running barefoot because you, basically, when you're wearing a shoe, your kind of your foot is insulated from the ground, and you have all this cushioning and stuff, right? And when you're barefoot, it forces you to run lightly and gently. And I think you could learn a lot from learning to run lightly and gently. I think good runners, whether they're wearing a shoe or not, run lightly and gently. And I think that's the I think. And so I think the important thing is how you run, how you use your body, and you can run well in shoes, and you can run terribly in shoes, and you can run well barefoot and terribly barefoot. But you know, being being barefoot, I think, can help you learn to run properly. But you don't need to be barefoot in order to, in order to be a good runner. And furthermore, if you suddenly take off your shoes and you know, you know, you read book Born to Run, you decide, oh my gosh, I'm going to go barefoot. I'm going to be, you know, I'm going to be like a Taramara. You will injure yourself really rapidly unless you transition slowly 
and learn to run properly. So you've got to do it really carefully. It's, you know, and, and, and don't do it in, in New England in the middle of the winter. I would never run barefoot in this, in this weather. No way, no, no, no how. And by the way, the Taramara don't run barefoot either. They wear sandals. I, I've, I, I've never, in the six trips I've made to, the, to, the, to that area, I've never seen uh, anybody barefoot there. Um, um, the other running question that I'm seeing a lot is, do you happen to have any resources for, um, you recommend for learning proper running form? Oh, well, there's a section on that in chapter nine. Um, um, and there's a lot of good, there's a lot of good websites out there. And, and there are a lot of experts here in, in Boston, for example, there's the Spalding uh, National Running Center that's run by Irene Davis. There's a lot of great, uh, um, uh, the, 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 the McKelly Center has, like that's, there's a lot of folks here in, in town who can also help you learn to run properly. There's a, uh, it's a, uh, but there's a lot of good websites out there as well. Um, uh, it's not that hard. It's basically posture, cadence, don't, don't land too hard, land with a relatively flat foot, get your knees up. Um, it's, it's, it's not that hard to learn to run properly. It's just a few skills, but uh, you have to kind of learn the muscle memory to get good at it. All right, we have a question from Connie. Um, Connie Chan asks, are there differences between males and females in terms of the benefits of exercise? Um, probably, yeah. I mean, um, for example, um, physical activity is important in women for, for, um, for lowering, well, <laughs> it depends on how you express this, but uh, just even running a, a, you know, 20, 30 miles a week around the Charles River has been shown to lower levels of progesterone and estrogen. Uh, in, 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 in healthy women. And one way of thinking about it is like, it's almost lowering your hormone levels. But the other is that if you're not physically active, you actually have abnormally high hormone levels. And, and, and we know that there's an association between very high levels of these reproductive hormones and, and for example, the probability of breast cancer. So it's one of the reasons that physical activity is so protective against, against breast cancer. Um, and it's more so than, than in terms of the effects of physical activity on testosterone. So I think that would be one example. Um, but for the most part, I would say that the benefits are, are very similar no matter, no matter who you are. Uh, we have a great question here from Winta. Um, Winta asks, in more urban settings, is there any trade-off between outdoor physical activity and exposure to air pollution? <laughs> Ooh, interesting question. Um, I suspect sometimes, I mean, um, I don't know how much good data there are on that. Um, Certainly, I've run in some places uh, that um, I felt like a, you know, after going for a run, I felt like I had smoked a pack of cigarettes, and I've never smoked cigarettes, so I'm not really quite sure what that's like. But I certainly was felt felt the the, the, the pollution. So um, so I suspect that uh, air quality can be can be a problem um, for 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 outdoor running. Fortunately, you know, that's not true in uh, in you know most of the year in most American cities. So um, but uh, but yes, that that can be a that can certainly be a factor. Again, you know, the most important thing is, is, is getting active and you know, finding the right environment where you can enjoy it and feel safe and feel healthy. And if that means being inside, that so be it. But, um, um, but certainly most people enjoy being outside more than they enjoy being inside. Um, a question from David, David Reason asks, does the relationship between exercise and decreased mortality depend on the duration in months or years that an individual has exercised? Oh, well, so there's a lot of data on that. There's a long answer to that question, but yes. I mean, the earlier, the more you do it, the, the more of the benefit you get. But if you start later on in life, you still get some benefit, the benefit. So, so, there's, so there's, there are studies which, which show, you know, the difference between people who've been lifelong physically active versus people who pick it up um, uh, or, or people who then stop being physically active. Um, and, um, and so, you know, the, as you might imagine, the data are that lifelong physical activity uh, is the best. Just keep it up, don't stop as you get older. Um, but um, but if, you, if you've been physically inactive and you, and you wanna become more physically active, there's, there's abundant data that there are enormous benefits um, from, from picking it up uh, in, in midlife. So there's ne it's never too late to start and, and there's no amount that's not beneficial. We have a tremendous amount of questions that I'm sifting through over here. Um, let's see, an anonymous attendee wants to know, how do we compare in our level of exercise with other primates? Oh my gosh, that's a great question. Yeah. So one of my favorite facts is that your average sedentary American is still more active than your typical wild chimpanzee. 
So chimpanzees spend about half their day feeding and they're just kind of sitting around putting stuff in their mouth and they're kind of mostly resting and digesting. And occasionally they go through little bouts of wild sort of activity, they fight and copulate and stuff like that. But really, you know, we talked about the physical activity level, right? The physical activity level of, 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 of sedentary humans is actually higher or, or, or sort of similar to, to chimpanzees and like gorillas. Oh my, gorillas are like, you know, they're, they're just sitting in a giant salad bowl. They like do nothing. They walk like a kilometer a day. They're not very physically active at all. So compared to other apes, humans are really dialed it up. We're much, much more physically active. And primates in general, uh, this is work by, by, by Herman Ponzer and, and, and colleagues, primates in general are actually less physically active than most mammals. So, so most mammals are pretty active, primates are kind of inactive, and humans have kind of redialed it up to being more active than, than our primate relatives. And that's actually a very important part of our biology. We've been selected to be more active than our, than our close cousins. Great question. That is absolutely fascinating. Um, a question from Jolanta Davis. Have you studied swimming or do you know anyone who studied swimming among different cultures? So yeah, there's not too much on swimming because you know humans, um, humans really aren't very good swimmers. So obviously swimming is, is people, something people love to do and there, there's, a, you know, there's a whole kind of, kind of scientific kind of conspiracy theory called the aquatic ape hypothesis where, where people think that you know, we evolved to swim and that explains why we're hairless and all that sort of stuff, not true. Um, but you know, swimming is obviously a wonderful thing to do. And, and of course there are you know, people all around the world near, 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 near oceans who swim. Um, in many parts of the world though, swimming is a very dangerous thing to do. Like in, in Africa, for example, where I do a lot of my field work, I, I don't swim, <laughs> it's, it's dangerous. There, there are crocodiles. And like, if you want, if you want, to, if you want to like shorten your life, go for a swim in, the, in, a, in one of the rivers or, or lakes in the, in the Serengeti, I don't recommend it. But so, so there's a reason people in some parts of the world don't swim that much, but, um, but you know, swimming is a wonderful form of physical activity. But just remember this, when Michael Phelps is swimming, a world, making the world record in the pool, right? You know, swimming faster than any other human has swum before, you can still walk along the side of the pool faster than he can swim. Right? He's, he's, he's fast for a human being, but he ain't very fast. All right, I think we have time for like a couple more. I, I, so many of these I wanna know your answer to. Um, Jean Kindleberger asks, what do you think of the four second workout that the New York Times has written about? Oh, I just read that with great delight. Well, look, the more we study high intensity interval training, um, and Jean, by the way, is a former neighbor, so hi, Jean. Uh, the more we study high interval training, um, the more, uh, we, more we realize that, um, that, that even short bursts of, of intensity can have really great benefits. And there's a recent paper that just came out from a lab in Texas, which showed that even repeated four second bouts, but there was a really intense four second bouts, right? Um, actually, uh, when they added up to a minute, really had a, a wonderful benefit. Um, so, so, you know, it's part of this general idea that the more we study physical activity, the more we realize that mixing it up is good, right? If you go out every day and do the same walking routine, that's fine, that's great. If that's what you like to do, that's fine. But you can get some benefits by mixing it up and occasionally putting in a little bit of intensity. Over time, it's like making coffee, drip, 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 drip. Over time, you'll get some benefit uh, from, from just a little bit of intensity. But, but remember, if you're if you're, if you're struggling, if you're infirm, you might wanna also see a doctor before you do that because there are more risks involved with, with high intensity. Okay, I think we have time for one last question. Um, and this is probably what all of us wanna know the answer to, Dan, which is um, Lisa asks, how can we make exercise more enjoyable? Oof, I think the way, I mean, there's no one answer, right? There are people who like to listen to music. They like to watch a, a TV show on, on a treadmill. Um, that's not my, my thing. I think for most people, and if you look at the evidence, for most people, the way to make it more enjoyable is to make it more social. Exercising with other people, right? Whether it's a dancing, which is a form of exercise with other people, or, 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 or running with a group of people, or walking with friends, or, or whatever. Of course, it's nice sometimes to be by yourself and have a sort of meditation, and I enjoy that too. But if, you're, if you want feedback and, and positive reinforcement and, 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 and also a commitment, right? Because I often run with my friend Aaron and I have to meet him at six o'clock in the morning and I don't wanna be there at six o'clock in the morning, but you know, he, he, you know, he's got, I can't leave him out on there in the corner or there in the dark, right? So I have to go out there and, 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 and join him. And, and you know, by the end of the run, I'm, I'm glad I did. So, so be, making it social makes it more necessary, but it also makes it more fun. And I think, um, and I think, uh, I think the more we can 
we can enjoy each other's company, particularly in this day and age when we're all so isolated um, because of this pandemic and forced to basically live in our houses and not see anyone, the more we can find ways to, to interact with each other and be active while we're doing it, I think the better off all of us will be. Well, thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. And I'm so sorry to everyone who's um, tremendous questions I didn't get the chance to ask I'm tonight. Sorry too. But um, until next time, so thank you, Dan, for your time and for this fascinating and ultimately compassionate event. I was nervous about, you know, my exercise habits and this made me feel tremendously, I don't know, better. There is so much empathy in this in this talk you gave. So we, thank we you. We have for that. to stop being exercised about yeah. exercise. Yeah. Yeah. I line. agree. I love that. Um, and thank you everyone for spending your evening with us. Please feel free to learn more about this book and to purchase Exercised on Harvard.com. So on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, the Harvard Division of Science, the Harvard Library, and the Leakey Foundation, have a healthy, not exercised January. Keep reading and please, please be well. Take care. Thanks.